I was so excited to get my shipment from Last Bottle Wines in the mail the other day full of incredible red wines all from Napa Valley. I love wine tasting, so having this to my door couldn't be happier. Also couldn't be more excited that today's episode is brought to you by Last Bottle Wines. If you don't know already, they're a Napa-based online wine shop with a twist. They offer just one hand-picked wine per day until it sells out, and they're always at incredible prices. We're talking 30 to 70% off retail. And the best part is that there's no subscriptions, no fees, and no minimum purchase. And I could not be more excited to bring this offer right now because they're having a marathon sale, which is coming up March 28th and 29th. Even better, we're offering Dateable listeners 10% off your first order with code Dateable. So if you are a wine lover like me, this is a great time to join. And did I mention that shipping is 100% free? So So what are you waiting for? Mark your calendar for March 28th and 29th or get on it earlier if you want. You can sign up at lastbottlewines.com and use code DATEABLE and find out why Last Bottle is the most fun way to discover and buy amazing wine. We are so thrilled to be partnering with Hinge. Hinge is the dating app designed to be deleted. As you all know, I'm a huge Hinge advocate as I met my partner of almost three years on the app. Even before meeting him, Hinge was always my go-to app because I met more relationship-minded people here and had some great dates. Clearly, I haven't been on the app for a little while, but I re-downloaded it to check out some of the new features. One that stood out to me was the voice prompt, my best friend's take on why you should date me, where your friend can hype you up. Not only does this make the profile creation less daunting, but it's not always easy to see your own green flags. So to test it out, I asked UA some fun prompts to get her take on what I could put if I was dating again. So the first one, how long have we known each other? What was your first impression of me and how has that changed? Julie and I have known each other for almost 10 years. My first impression of Julie was that she's very social, but I've learned that she has a lot more depth to her beyond the social butterfly that she is. My next prompt, what do you think are my green flags? I would say she's deeply loyal. She believes in love, curious mindset, and she is fearlessly ambitious. And then last but not least, what kind of friend am I? Julie is the kind of friend who will always have your back, no matter what. Damn, that feels nice to hear. So download Hinge and try voice prompts today. Then find some one worth deleting the app for. The Dateable Podcast is an insider's look into modern dating that the Huffington Post calls one of the top 10 podcasts about love and sex. On each episode, we'll talk to real daters about everything from sex parties to sex droughts, date fails to diaper fetishes, and first moves to first loves. I'm your host, Yue Xu, former dating coach turned dating sociologist. You'll also hear from my co-host and producer, Julie Krafchick, as we explore this crazy dateable world. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Dateable, a show all about modern dating where we try to dig into the whys of people's behavior. Now this was a pretty sad week, as if 2020 couldn't get any worse, but RBG is um, not with us anymore. I know, I feel like she was such a feminist icon, like I think there is definitely a part of all women and men probably too that shed a little tear for this one. I also love the fact that she was still relevant in her 80s. Mm -hmm. And I think that we live in a world where there's so much ageism in our society. And she's proven that all wrong. She's maintained her relevance. If not, she's become even more relevant as she aged. I know. It's really unfortunate that we no longer have her with us, but her effects will be a lifetime. So there was one quote I found that, I mean, there's so many that she has around like just, you know, equality, especially in the workplace and just having a voice in the room. But there was one that related, I think, to relationships really well that I exceptionally loved. It was, women will have achieved true equality when men share with them the responsibility of bringing up the next generation. Amen to that. Seriously. And I think I might have jinxed myself last week talking about baby showers and um, all of this because I feel like this weekend for me was like full of baby stuff. Like I had a baby shower on Saturday and then I had a hundred day party on today that was virtual. 
So at least the 100 day party was a half an hour. It was kind of like a quick get in, get out. And I feel the most uncomfortable I felt with COVID at the baby shower yesterday. So if I, I don't want to jinx myself, but I feel like it is like payback for all this shit I said about baby showers the following week. I'm just really <laughs> surprised that there was an in-person baby shower during this time. I mean, it was outdoors, but it was just like there were people that traveled and I just, I don't think I knew enough information going in, which is a reminder to like always ask more. I made some assumptions and I probably shouldn't have done that. I mean, hopefully I'm, I'm like kidding that hopefully things will be okay. Like I don't want to jinx myself, but this one was like a very traditional baby shower too, with a lot of like those games and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I failed miserably at most of the games, but I did kill it at the name the song that has the word baby in it. And then they did it again at the 100 day party today. And I killed it again because a lot of them were the same. (laughs) So there you go. Silver lining. (laughs) Like took the knowledge from the day before (laughs) to apply at this 100 day party. Exactly. And then I have like a friend on the drive over that was talking about how she wants to do a gender reveal party. And I definitely was like, oh, please don't. You know, I'm like, they're so archaic. And she was like, oh, and I'm like, I need to like learn to hold my tongue a little because people don't all think this way. So yeah, I yeah, after I re listened to our episode last week. <laughs> yeah, I, I felt a little bit bad because I think people have the right to do whatever they want, and they can celebrate whatever they want. But it is my choice to not go. Yes. And so it's not so much about the actions of the people having these parties. It's just that my choice is to not to partake. The problem is, though, people get offended by that because that's of what course. drove me to go to this one is because I felt an obligation to go. Right. But <laughs> the <laughs> end of the day, we always say this too: never show up to a date in a bad mood. So you shouldn't show up to your friends events with like negative feelings to begin with. It's probably more beneficial, right, to just stay home. No, you you got to embrace it. I mean, you do you. Everyone should do what works for them. So yeah. I agree, like, maybe we went negative. But I did get a lot of people DMing so that they felt the same sentiment. I think a lot of people <laughs> secretly feel the same, same sentiment. Sometimes even the people throwing the parties are like, exactly. why am I doing this? Why is this happening? But that's, you know, that's the that's what society's been telling us to do. So that's what we do because we celebrate gender reveal parties. You know, but something else that came out of last week's <laughs> episode was, you know, this whole discussion about virginity. And you brought up the episode of Sex in the City where they met a bunch of like 20 year olds mm-hmm. who were celebrating their virginity. We just went on a hike today and there was a family hiking. And one of the kids, this boy, maybe around like 11, 12, was wearing a sweatshirt that said virginity rocks. <laughs> <laughs> So many things went to my head. First of all, I was like, can I get a picture with you? I really should have asked for a picture with him because I'm like, this kid is out with his parents. Good for his him. His whole family. Yeah. Rocking the sweatshirt. But also my second question was, where do you get that? Like, do they sell that at Urban Outfitters? Do they? <laughs> is it on Amazon? I kind of want one. And I guess the last question I have is, is that a cool thing now? Like for kids to celebrate your virginity? I have a I have a coworker that's probably, she actually doesn't work with me anymore, but she used to, and she was in her very early 20s. We were doing a video call because it was over COVID, Mm -hmm. and she pulled up like a pen or something that said something about like virginity rocks or something. It didn't say virginity rocks. I forget (laughs) the exact word, but it was basically like affirming virginity. And like someone was like, wait, what does your pen say? Like, oh, poor girl. So maybe it is on brand. I don't know. Maybe it's a trendy thing. We'll have to talk to more Gen Zs. Or, you know, there's always going to be people with different values. You know, you may love a baby shower. You may love gender reveal. You may save yourself for marriage. Like, it's all up to you. But none of that has ever been a t-shirt saying. Like, even during the hookup culture, when hookup culture was at its peak, nobody was like rocking a shirt that said, I suck lots of dicks. You know, like, <laughs> it was just very shocking to me that someone would put this on hey, a sweatshirt celebrating their sexual choices. When we thereof. launch our line of merch, we are going to have a DTF mask. So people yeah. will have their opportunity. Yeah, it could mean many different things. <laughs> 
Maybe we should have some virginity sayings. Maybe that's the new line of merch that we haven't thought about. (laughs) Yeah, virginity is the new black. I don't know, something like that. It's cool. Born again. You know what it is, though? I feel like you're probably hyper aware because we just did the episode. Like, I feel like that always tends to happen. It's like when you are looking for signs of something, you start to see it. For sure. But also, I would say lots of people notice the sweatshirt. (laughs) I mean, a a sweatshirt's aggressive. That's like more than like a pen, for sure. And it wasn't like a small embroidered two-liner. It was front and center covering his entire chest wow. in bright yellow virginity rocks. I, I don't know. Maybe like that's his high school mascot. Maybe like I'm, <laughs> the Virgin Mary. I misread it. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're the San Mateo virgins or something. I don't know. <laughs> oh my God. I totally I hope forgot that's my dog was here. New school. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're the virgins. Go virgins. <laughs> hey, there's like the Trojans. How is it that different? Yeah, maybe it's the same thing. It was actually like USC colors, you know, like the school, <laughs> USC Trojans, their colors. They've changed. They were like, nope, we got to go to virginity now. The, yeah. virgin, the Trojans we, were the vir- The virgins were the Trojans. <laughs> we are a born again school now. <laughs> we're born again virgins. I will say, though, I got a lot of other people that did reach out about my date that I shared last week in mm-hmm. your advice. And everyone was like, nope, don't do it. Don't do yeah, it. Don't so do it. they were like, I agree with UA on that one. So I think there's something about this 80-20 rule with virtual. I like it. I'm going to keep it going. I like it too. But what's the latest with that? Has anything else happened? Um, You know, nothing. I haven't heard from him. I think, though, I also kind of just stopped replying to stuff. So Mm -hmm. it kind of faded. I'm guilty Mm -hmm. of the slow fade. But I did get some other weird dating behavior this week that I'll throw out to you. Yes, please. So (laughs) one of them was someone new on Bumble. I just like because, you know, the woman messages first. So I hit him up and I was like, oh, how's your day going or something? And he writes back immediately. You look tall. I'm only five, seven. And I'm like, Oh, okay. Like, no. I mean, I get like people have insecurities. Like, I have insecurities about things too. I'm not judging it, but to put that out like immediately was crazy. And I was oh, like, well, no. I'm only 5'5. Five, five. And then he's like, okay, we can talk then. And I'm like, okay, you've lost me at this point. <sighs> yeah. I'm not saying that you don't have a right mm. to your insecurities, but you don't need to lead with your insecurities. Like, lead with something great about yourself or just answer the fucking question. How's your day? Like, I didn't ask you about your height. Okay, so this is where we have to take a moment and talk to all the men out there who are insecure about their height. And I get it. You've all written to us. I We heard it for years that statistically it's shown that men who are over 5'10 get more matches on these dating apps, etc. Women always have like a height preference and a height minimum. Yes, these are true. But what people report and put as their preferences don't necessarily reflect reality. I have lots Lots of male friends who are under 5'6", who have girlfriends who are taller than them or same height, and their height was never a hindrance for them when they were dating, but it is a hindrance when you put it at the forefront of your yes. messages. When you lead with that, it already shows that you have this insecurity that you're exactly. trying to focus on. It's not a sexy thing. No. And I mean, okay, I'll play devil's advocate and let's say this was really important to you that I wasn't taller than you. You can work it into the conversation later. Don't put that as like the first message back when someone asks you what how your day was. <laughs> it's just so bad. Don't you don't you have that on your profile, your height? I do. I do have and it. On. <laughs> but you know, everyone lies about their height. Like guys always shave off. Like I had a friend that went on a date and was like, oh, he was shorter than he said. I'm like, are you surprised by this? This is like yeah. I automatically assume there's a chance that a guy is gonna be at least one to two inches shorter than they say. Like I'm already yeah. factoring that in. Yes. I will say this again. Men can bitch all they want about women wanting tall men. And women will never stop talking about wanting tall men. It's just a fact, okay? Women are always going to be like, oh, I like them a little tall. I like them a little tall. Let's look at reality. It does not always reflect what people say. We see people (laughs) of the same height all the time getting together. That's what's really happening. So stop focusing on what's happening on the apps because that's not a reflection of what could happen for you in reality. And also maybe the deal breaker isn't your height because that wasn't yes. the turnoff for me. I would have totally been okay with it. It was the fact that you led with that immediately. And like you weren't going to talk to me if I was taller. 
Like basically. Absolutely. So that was weird be dating behavior that's number weird. one. Yeah, that's weird. <laughs> but you don't want to lead with that. And then the second one I encountered was I brought this up that I had a, fo- a phone call date the week before. And then we were supposed to do saying, oh, like a foot fetish day. I don't know. I thought you were going to lead with like <laughs> foot or foot coming up. <laughs> that would be, I'm like, that's weird. Now I feel like one. I'm going to underwhelm you of how basic <laughs> this is going to be. <laughs> but yeah, I had the guy that I did the phone call with mm-hmm. last week. We had a videotape planned and we talked about uh-huh. it on Monday. And I was like, oh, I could do Monday or Wednesday. And he's like, let's do tonight. Great. This was at like 11, 10, 11 in the morning. Okay. So I'm getting ready for the date. We were, t- we were supposed to talk at 8 o'clock p.m. He messages me at 7.45 mm. and was like, hey, you seem really great, but I actually just decided to move forward like more like seriously with someone else, <sighs> which... You know, maybe he is, maybe he's not. That's good for you. Again, like we only talked one time on the phone. I've never even seen what you look like. So I'm not that attached. But don't tell me it's 745. Like, thank God I actually like didn't get ready because you and I had recorded earlier that day. So I already Mm -hmm. just like did my hair for that. But what if I was like spending all this time getting ready and then you just drop that? I'd be so annoyed. So that's my rant. (laughs) When you told me about this, when this happened to you, my first thought was, what happened in the course of that day? You know, on this podcast, we always want to get to the bottom of like why people do the things they do. I wonder if he was trying to line people up, but he had like one person that was a front runner waiting for her to text him back. And the minute she did text him back, he is like, okay, yes, this I'm going to go with her and nobody else. You know, I, there's something again, very insecure about that move too. I don't know. I mean, I get in COVID era, people are like defining relationships and being exclusive a lot faster, especially like, let's say she's like, maybe they have a date lined up and she's like, I'm down to hook up or like kiss you, but I need to know you're not dating anyone else. So like Mm. maybe there was some conversation that pushed around or maybe he just decided for whatever reason that we weren't the right fit and he made the whole thing up because I've certainly said stuff like that before. So the truth is you'll never know. And it's probably not worth even thinking about why, like it just wasn't the right fit. And to be honest, I was skeptical for some location reasons before anyway. So Mm -hmm. ultimately, it probably just worked itself out the way it was supposed to. I'm just more annoyed at the the timing. Like that is annoying to me. Yes. 15 minutes before. Come on. Yes. That's just not cool. That's kind of disrespectful. So I admit myself, I feel like virtual dates have made me a little flakier because they're Mm. just so easy to cancel because you're not like going anywhere. You know, the other person isn't going anywhere. But But I do think this is a reminder that people still have cleared their schedule to some degree. They still have maybe taken some time to freshen up and look their best on the video date. So I will be more conscious for myself moving forward. So I guess that's what I learned from this situation. Look at you, Julie Craft Chick, looking inward, (laughs) not blaming other people. You're like, look at my own actions. I will make sure I won't. (laughs) So dateable right now. (laughs) You're so dateable right now. And speaking of being so damn dateable. Any other dating updates before we get to our would you rather? No, my only other dating update is that I finally cut my freaking hair, which I feel like a new person. So anyone that's that's our plug for YouTube, but anyone that's checking us out on YouTube, seriously, I am always the first that says like dating really comes from within, but there is a side that you do need to look like the best you can be, right? Like never going to say to like look a certain way, but I will admit after I got the haircut, I'm like, oh, I feel a lot more confident to go on video dates right now. Absolutely. (laughs) You want to feel good about yourself. It could be as simple as a haircut or even like putting on mascara for myself sometimes. Yep. So I did (laughs) haircut, eyebrow wax. I was like on a roll this week. Dang. You just went down that assembly line. Yeah. (laughs) I know. I just messaged my eye lash girl i'm like are you open because i'm really missing my lashes <laughs> <Yeah>. right now <laughs> i feel like all these people are getting these types of messages like i've missed yeah. you so much <laughs> but it's almost like a drug deal because she's like i can only operate in a hotel room <laughs> you can only pay me venmo or cash oh my god we're gonna see I'm like ua desperate. on the street and 
She's going to be just at her eyelash person. I have like a beeper on yeah. me, you know, I'm like waiting. Which room number? I am desperate. But I do want to get to our would you rather from last yeah. week. Uh, it's, a, it's a funny, funny question. The question was, after dating someone pretty seriously for a few months who you like, would you rather find out that they've been fired mm. five times from five different jobs or they've been married five times to five different people? Julie, what did you pick? I mean, I have to go with the five firings just because I'm just thinking about it logically. The amount of jobs one has in their lifetime, like you can have a lot of jobs where getting married five times feels like that's like a lot of your life, essentially. Mm. I would assume they were like quick turnarounds. And mm -hmm. While I don't ever want to judge anyone for their relationship past, because I do think there's like always a bigger story and we never know the full picture, it would just make me gun shy entering into a relationship, I think, if someone had done that. But maybe I would opt to be like, just hear them out a little of like, why? Like what happened? Like maybe there was some valid reason or something that like, you just never know someone's situation. Like maybe there was a situation that it wasn't their fault it ended or it ended because wait did they have to get divorced or could they have like been widowed they don't know so you don't know right you just don't know so but i don't know i'm still gonna go with the jobs i would prefer that what would you do <laughs> yeah i think i would have to agree with you simply because after a few months of dating someone you would hope that they would have told you they've been married five times true right true but it, but people don't necessarily have to divulge their employment history right right so if they're they've been hiding the marriage thing from you all this time, there is something a little shady there. It feels more relevant to relationships. However, at the same time, if you are building a life with someone and they're getting fired from jobs all the time, that's actually yes. pretty important information to know too. I just think the, the reasons why they could get fired could vary a lot more dramatically. Right. It wouldn't come up in conversation as easily. So I you're guess. saying it's the misleading part that would bother you more than it's the actual. It's the misleading part, yes. Mm. But the other part, I mean, I always try to play devil's advocate. Yes, I don't want to hear that someone's been married five times, but you're right. They could have been widow. They could have been um, fleeting marriages. They could have been abusive marriages. Yeah, you they just had to get know. out. Yeah, it could have been really quick turnarounds. Also shows that they are not afraid of commitment. That's for sure. <laughs> that's so, a positive. It's a positive. Yes. You just don't know. I hate to be judgmental, but there's something that triggers more judgment on that for whatever reason. Yes. Yes, it's the five times like, oh, man, if I met you, you're like, let's say you're in your 40s and you've been married five times already. When did you start when you were 13? You, you know? know what it is, too, is like like the, you know, tradition is that you get married once and that's it. Mm -hmm. So even people that have been married twice, there is uh, there's a failure complex. I'm not saying that they are a failure, but I know that there's a lot yeah. of like studies that people feel like a failure because marriage didn't work out. So I think knowing that you're supposed to do this once versus like jobs, like very rarely would anyone expect you to have the same job for your entire life in this day and totally. age. Totally. But I would also say in this day and age, it's really hard to get fired from jobs. Companies don't want a lawsuit That's on their true. hands. It takes a lot, a lot. That's they true. rather That's lay true. you off or keep you in a different department. So to be fired five different times, there may be some characteristic problems about you that are also shady. I would be very worried that you can't keep a job or there's something just innately wrong about you. I didn't think you... about it that way because I think of like laying off in the same realm, but you're right, mm -mm. being fired versus laid off is very different or quitting yourself. Like even if it gets so bad, yes. quitting yourself yes. versus getting fired is yes. very different. They don't, don't want to give you unemployment either. They don't want to give you that companies shit. Companies will try everything <laughs> not to fire you. Exactly. They'll make you <laughs> quit yourself first. So. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why it's a close tie, but I was still much rather hear that they were fired than married five times. <laughs> but unless, you know, unless if I've been married like multiple times, I'd be like, cool. <laughs> so Me too. What, what did the people say? What did the listeners say? The people said. The, the people smart, were... enlightened people of ours. <laughs> <laughs> the results of this poll were exactly in line with us. 70% of people said they would have rather hear someone was fired five 
five times and only 30% said the married thing. It's that damn with stigma. The, yep. It's this, yeah. But it's the same kind of discussion that we were having. It's like, what do you have to do to be married five different times? Or what do you have to do to be fired five different times? Super fascinating discussion. <laughs> but that's our uh, would you rather. <laughs> yes. Well, speaking of marriages, we have a really wonderful couple that we have today. We have Kofo and Theo is a couple that we talk to and we've been wanting to talk to an interracial couple for some time. And especially like in light of everything that's happened with George Floyd and Black Lives Matter, like in this couple, we have a black woman and a white man. And we just want to, you know, be, have that open, candid conversation about just, you know, like all the things that come up regarding race when it comes into a relationship. And I think what was interesting about this couple specifically that we'll get into is that they didn't have necessarily like that friction you think about mm -hmm. like you think about like oh the parents don't like them or they're getting like all this like hate speech or whatever and like there was definitely times where things were said to them but it was never like as blatant as the stories that tend to make the headlines but I think why we wanted to talk to them is a couple reasons is in a way it actually makes it like more real that even mm -hmm. when that stuff isn't happening there's still so much that goes into interracial relationships and thinking about just like what it really means to merge two cultures. And a big part of it too is that they are at the life stage that they're looking to bring a baby into this world. So mm -hmm. it's no longer just a white man with a black uh, wife. It's I'm going to be having a black baby now. And what is really unique about their story is that they had no problems getting together. And no. Like, <laughs> like what you were saying, Julie, there was no friction getting together. There wasn't like, oh, we should really think about this. What are what does this mean for our families or how would society view us? None of these conversations went into their mind. They just simply liked each other and they got together. But the what we're seeing is the evolution of their relationship in this marriage, in this time, in their own lifetime, life stage of wanting to have kids and thinking about that next generation. Just thinking about having kids is bringing all kinds of conversations into their daily lives that they never really had before. And we witnessed some of that in real time <laughs> on, this, on this episode. So it's almost like watching a reality TV show because just watch it all unfold. But they are a lovely couple and I can't wait to get to their story. Before we do that, we also like to introduce other fabulous podcasts that we know of. And here's one. This one's called The Magic Hour podcast. It's spelled M A J for Mercedes and Jade, who are the two female hosts of the show. That's so clever. The podcast is all about self healing, introspection, and becoming a light for others. A show dedicated to uncovering life's most coveted truths, where they interview world renowned guests from all walks of life, revealing the specific recipe for becoming a remarkable person. This is what I love about this podcast. They include a section in every episode where they relay what they call a magic trick, Ooh. which is like a life <laughs> hack of some sort. It's simple and it's profound and it helps you basically live a better life. So again, that podcast is called The Magic Hour Podcast. Announcements? Awesome. I think just quick ones, you know, for anyone new definitely check out our Facebook group. This is where the magic happens if we're going to tie it back. So the magic hour is every Thursday night when we do a happy hour. So there's just so much great conversation there. So definitely join the secret love in the time of Corona by the Dateable Podcast Facebook group. And if you want to keep the conversation going, we are all constantly on our Instagram. <laughs> so you can DM us, you can interact with our posts. We're constantly putting up polls and stories, etc. Just random stuff, but also like insider information about our guests and the episodes. So that's at Dateable Podcast on Instagram. I think the last announcement is definitely share this episode with a friend. I think if your friend is in an interracial relationship themselves, it's definitely a go-to, but also even if you're not, like I think there's just the more we can keep the conversation going about race and the fact that it does very much show up in dating and relationships and all the things we were just talking about, like pretty much anyone can benefit from this episode. Yes. And let's get to the benefits now. Here's our conversation with Kofo and Theo.
Kofo and Theo sounds like a band. <laughs> like you two should be in a band. The Kofo and Theo band. They are married. So I'm going to introduce them before we get into what their band is all about. Um, Kofo is in her mid 30s. She's black, first generation Nigerian American, originally from the Northeast, been in Northern California for the past eight years. And she's married to Theo. Theo is also in his mid 30s. He's white. He's also originally from the Northeast been in Northern California for 10 years. So this is the first time we've really like given the introduction with people's ethnicities because this discussion is about interracial relationships and marriages. So how long have you two been married for? We've been married for two years now. Um, we've been together for, what is it, 18 years? Didn't really yeah. want to rush into things, huh? <laughs> you know, it's funny because I, it was my fault. Like, you know, while, when we were in college, he's all graduating now. And, you know, my dad is asking me about marriage. And I'm like, no, I have to be me before I'm a we. Like, and then he took that to heart for how many years? <laughs> I don't know, 10 more. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Very patient. So, so yeah. <laughs> Let's go back to college then. You met oh, in yeah. college. How did this meet cute happen? Well, we were friends. Like I was not interested in him like that. <laughs> like that wasn't a thing. He lived in my dorm room. The dorm Ever. building. I didn't live in dorm, dorm building. Room. Not my dorm room. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I wasn't, I wasn't that much of a stalker. Come yeah, exactly. on. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> Wait, so so what moved it then from friendship, no romantic interest to clearly you're married now? What was it like Memorial Day weekend or Labor Day weekend or something? And I went home with him because I didn't have anything to do. Everyone else was going somewhere. And I was like, all right, I'll come with you. And we were just friends at that point. And we went mudding with his friends. And I was just like, wow, I, I like this guy. Like, he's a pretty cool guy. You know, I got to like see his personality more, seeing him in his element. But then, you know, freshman year, we nothing, I mean, nothing happened. We continued to be friends. Then I think beginning of our sophomore year, he was trying to date this girl from back home. And I was trying to coach him on how he could get with her. And she was uh-huh. not, that girl wasn't having it. But like in that process, I'm like, wow man, I really do like him. So Mm. back then it was AOL Instant Messenger. And I was like, I got, I'm going to tell him how I feel and I'm going to send it in in an instant message. And I did that. And he never responded. (laughs) Claims to the, if you want to claim differently today, you can, but he claimed that he never got it. I just don't remember. Yeah. (laughs) Theo's like, I get so many instant messages that I... (laughs) And half of our audience is having major flashbacks, and the other half has no idea what we're talking about. Yeah, they're like, like, what is AOL? What is that? You mean LOL? I don't think it had the little bubbles like iMessage, though. No, no little bubbles. You couldn't see if anybody was talking. It was just dead silence uh, for a while. It was heartbreaking. And Kofo, did you pour your heart out in this instant message? Oh, yes! Kidding me? This was a long message. I was like, you know, you never know you really how you really feel about someone until you like get to know them. And I really figured out like through this process that like I really like you and nothing. Nothing. Yeah, but but as as you learned, I could have read it and thought I was gonna reply and just completely forgot. Which he does a lot. I do that a lot. He's like, I replied. What? To a message where someone's pouring their heart out to you? You just forget to reply? (laughs) Get him. Thank you. So what moved it then? Like, how did this actually progress? How did it progress? Okay, so here here we go. I'm all sad. And I'm like, he doesn't like me to all of our mutual friends. Like, somebody must have, like, talked to him at some point. We were at a party. And he came up to me. He was like, Kofo, can I talk to you? And I was like what do you want? Cause at this point I'm over it. I don't want to hear anything. Like I've just kind of accepted that it's not going to happen. And he's like, will you be my girlfriend? And I booked it straight out of the room, went to a friend's dorm room that was like two floors up. And I was like, don't tell him I'm here. He just asked me to be his girlfriend. He calls her knowing full well where I would have gone. Cause like we were like best friends at that time. And she tells him where I am. He comes up, we have a talk. And then he's like, and then that it was, it was, it was over from there. Did I hear this correctly? You were running away from the man who I ran asked away. you to be his girlfriend. Yes. Got it. Yes. Okay. You thought that was yeah. the, the yeah, right yeah, thing yeah. to do. I was, I was terrified. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was survival instinct. It was <laughs> survival instinct. It was, prob- it was probably good. <laughs> but Theo, I, you haven't said much about the pursuit, ah. of, <laughs> the pursuit of Kofo. How did you decide to ask her to be your girlfriend? Maybe good. <sighs> 
Well, I mean, I, I guess it's sort of a similar story. It was through our friendship. She helped me talk me through all these things. And I realized like, she's clearly way better of a woman than any of these other people I'm talking to. Other uh, people? It was one girl. I don't get it twisted. <laughs> Fair. I do remember like there was a specific trip. I went home and hung out with that same girl who I thought I liked. And like basically it was just like, what am I doing? This is stupid. And then after that, that's that's sort of when I changed my mindset. So did race like play in at all? Were there any points that you were like, this is either gonna work or not work? <laughs> a week later. Fancy you should ask that. <laughs> oh, a week later. A week later, I was like, you know, I got to thinking about it. I'm like, I don't know how this is going to work. Because clearly, if somebody asks you to be your girlfriend, that means that you're going to get married. So I'm like, how will this work? <laughs> you know, I'm like, that's that was my next step. And I was thinking forward, you know. And so I called him over to the to my dorm room. I made him dinner and I told him that like we weren't going to get married. So I didn't see how this was going to work because in my eyes, like I didn't bring up race with him, but that's what I was alluding to mm. that, you know, it was just going to be difficult. Like what? <laughs> you know, I just didn't see it working. And he didn't leave. Like, he just stayed there. <laughs> and watched, we watched television, and it just continued. Like, I tried to end it because of that. And he just stayed there. Yeah, pretty much. I was, uh, I was just that, yeah, I was a sort of dumb young kid. I didn't think any different of it. I just was like, whatever. We can figure it out. How hard could it be, right? Like, yeah. Also, to be fair, what college student is thinking, if we date now, we're going to get married? Me. <laughs> Oh, well, Mia, you know, if, you, if you're doing something, it's got to be worth it. There's, you know, there's an end game. I would be a little bit close to that too, I suppose. Yeah, you were, we were, we're both unique in that way where we're like, okay, mm. you know, if you're in the relationship. So had either of you dated interracially before? I mean, it's not really a boyfriend. I had a guy that I thought was cute, like right before college, but that wasn't really dating. He happened to be white, but... That was just all that was available to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's romantic. Not Theo. a preference, just what was there, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I suppose that's fairly accurate. And then I was I was pretty just like pretty naive and just whatever. Date whoever I like. Uh, where I grew up, yeah, no, that wasn't really there wasn't really a lot of diversity. So So were there any challenges that you faced in the initial stages of your relationship? Other than the normal relationship challenges anybody would face? I'd say, I mean, we'd go to, you know, parties or we'd go out in public and, you know, you get comments here and there and obviously i'd be more inclined to notice them what kind of comments uh just like you know nasty like name calling um and word plenty of times you know mostly directed towards towards me and anytime he noticed like <clears throat> really wanted him to notice especially if we were at a bar because then he want to tr start a fight mm -hmm. i'm like no let's not you know we're not doing that <laughs> Like, yeah, I think you got, yeah, you got kicked out of one bar because wow. the bartender called me some, he called me, I can't even remember what it was, but he called me some slur and yeah. To your face? Oh yes, to my face. And this guy popped off and we got kicked out because he just kept going after him. And of course the bartender didn't admit to doing anything wrong, so... But these are comments directed towards you, towards me, not towards yeah, me not specifically. towards your relationship or your you as a couple. It'd be comments towards me or comments towards like, or what are you doing with that one? Or like, mm. you know, things like that. And have you experienced any sort of pushback from the black community? You know, for as many comments as I got about me being the N word or me being this, or why are you with this? I get comments from black community saying, oh, you couldn't find a black brother or mm. you couldn't find a black man. And it's like, that's funny. I remember are you more serious? of those. Because that's more directed towards you too. That's true. Yeah. How do you respond to those? Or do you even bother responding? I mean, it'd just be like a dirty look. And are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. And just keep walking. Oh, first of all, because it's like, where were you when I was single? <laughs> oh, you didn't come for me then. So I don't want to hear anything about you. And it's found a decent human being. And that's who I'm with. It's really none of your business other than that. You know, I, I shouldn't have to explain that, especially to randos on the street. You know, what about your family, Kofo? The thought of a, a boy, a, a man in my life was, I think for them, like, <laughs> You need to focus on school. So that was their first reaction. Like, <laughs> I think my brother was the first to meet him. My brother loved him. Uh, my brother, like they, they, you guys kicked it off right away. 
we found out later at our wedding, my dad, you know, had this speech. You know, my parents are from Nigeria, but they watched all these American movies and he'd watched, um, what's the name of the movie? Blue Lagoon. He thought that Theo looked like the main character from the Blue Lagoon. So at the wedding, he admitted that when he would, when they would come to drop off groceries at school, Theo would be there to help. And my, my dad, I guess, would say to my mom, who's this Blue Lagoon guy helping my daughter with her groceries? <laughs> like, that was his thing. He's like, who is he? Like, what is he doing? And apparently he waited till, like, you know, the grades came out. He's like, okay, can't be bad. Her grades are, are still doing pretty good, you know? So, like, that was the extent of his care in the world. He just wanted to make sure that I was still doing good in school. So, <laughs> I mean, I was always around, but I don't know when it was they, like, accepted that we were dating they accepted we were dating when i graduated college <laughs> right there you go like, okay yes it's fine <laughs> now. you got your degree <laughs> yeah exactly yeah so kofo i know you mentioned like you were a little hesitant at the beginning because you couldn't see this turning into marriage because mm -hmm. he w was it because you envisioned yourself being with a black man or like what was it that was that reason. It's not that I envisioned myself necessarily with a black man. I didn't really envision my, like, I didn't see the man that I was going to marry. Like, he did not have a, I did not have a picture, a clear p picture of who this man would look like. For some reason, it felt like we were coming from two completely different worlds because, <laughs> this is going to sound weird, but He's just from a very different place than, I, than I'm from. It just, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it, but it just felt like we were coming from two different planets is all. But before we get to that, we want to take a moment to thank our wonderful sponsor, BetterHelp. In these unprecedented times, some of us may be experiencing unprecedented feelings. For me, it's anxiety. And working on our mental health with BetterHelp has ensured that we're not alone in this. They offer online counseling with professional, credible, and compassionate therapists in a safe and private environment. Their counselors specialize in depression, relationships, anxiety, trauma, many other areas. And with 3,000 U.S. licensed professionals across all 50 states, they make it easier than ever to find help. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp. They're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. And now for Dateable listeners only, you get 10% off your first month with the code Dateable. Get started today by going to betterhelp.com slash Dateable and join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health, Julie and I included. <laughs> Again, that's betterhelp.com slash Dateable and use the code D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E for 10% off your first month. Now back to this episode. And then for you, Theo, when you since you're also on the more serious side of the spectrum when it comes to dating and then <laughs> yeah, apparently, now that we think and about converting it. that to marriage, did you also think about the future with Kofo and were there any challenges that you saw, like if you were to get married? Uh, I mean, I was, I was ignorant about it. I, I didn't care. I was just like, whatever. And I just kind of forced it, dragged her everywhere um, completely mindlessly. Wasn't super aware or anything. I think the very first time I met Kofo uh, was in my dorm room and she noticed I had a cousin who was black. Well, my cousin obviously white, but she married a black guy and she pointed it out and I said, yeah, that means we can get married. And so that was like day one for whatever dumb reason I <laughs> said that. Yeah. What but, does that mean exactly? Does it mean that someone paved the way in your family? I, yeah, I guess. Right. It's like just kind of like some random statement to make that's just like yeah see it's it's okay i don't know i didn't put a, obviously didn't put a lot of thought into it not that i always do put a lot of well, i don't know that you were saying it for that it was like something you connect with and like dorky theo at that time wouldn't have put that together <laughs> <laughs> so what got you over it then like what made you come around like i know theo didn't leave your house but like outside of that <laughs> what uh, no, it's, the streaming his, order yeah. <laughs> Persistence, his persistence. He stuck by, and he was, you know, again, we were like best friends, you know, before we started dating. So he was still that constant, always there if I needed anyone, if I needed a shoulder, you know, like he was just there. He was so supportive. Like I was into all these, um, you know, extracurricular things. He was always there, you know, to support me. So it was, <laughs> it was his persistence on anything. It was your persistence. And I was like, okay, well, he's, you know, he's my friend and, and, and I'm comfortable with him and he's a good human being. So I'll stick with it, you know, until the wheels fall off, I guess. Mm -hmm. For some reason, I stopped thinking about marriage at that point, I think. It was just, okay, this is just what's happening in the moment. And I kind of just let it happen. Forever. 
forever. Yeah. Forever. <laughs> yes. And then, you know, I think it's interesting you guys bring up like during that time in college, we can all reminisce about those years in college where you're just yeah. kind of naive and dumb mm. and idealistic yeah. and you just think the world will be exactly how the world is in college. Right. When did it hit you that the real world was so different than the college world? I don't know, maybe seeing like a darker side of society. You know, it was definitely those times when you'd leave campus and get, you know, different looks. Because on campus, it's like pretty diverse, but you leave campus, you get the different looks. Or when we'd go visit his hometown and his hometown, like my hometown was not diverse at all, but that's the hometown I'm used to. So I know that space. But then to go to visit his hometown and there being no diversity and being scared because it's, a, it's an environment I don't know, mm. you know, that for me was not a wake up call, but it was a bit, it was something that I had to hold on to, you know, to be cautious of just to, like keep my guard up a bit just to protect myself, you know? And for you, Theo, were there any surprises? I mean, bring, bring home a black girlfriend to your hometown. Was there any, anything happened that surprised you? There were, I mean, everyone was quite polite, I guess. Like, I mean, there was never any controversy. There was never any outward. <laughs> They're like, Theo has a girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, she's just, such a caring person people usually latch on to her as soon as they know her right like that's always been my my catch is like i, I know it. i'll throw her in a situation she'll she'll talk for both of us because like rather i would go off in a corner usually and find something <laughs> weird to do and she's off talking with everybody making sure my grandparents are okay like <laughs> making sure everyone's taken care of helping out so yeah i mean i think the intros the intros were all pretty easy uh there was there's not a lot remarkable about them. We hung out with a wide array of my friends. You know, I went to public school, I went to private school. So I had like a pretty wide array of people from different backgrounds, albeit not diverse. Yeah. Um, but ones you might anticipate having more problem than others. And when I when I think back of it back then, I was like, well, I, I can handle anything that happens. It's going to be, it'll be stress on me, like not her, which is probably completely opposite of what it actually was. But me back then was like, oh, I, I don't care. I'm going to force in people's faces and, and I'm going to be the one to stand up for this. But I don't think I would have would have been nearly as sensitive back then to, to picking up on, you know, the, the looks or the side looks or different behaviors. I mean, I know I wasn't back then compared to now, for sure. I was going to say, I feel like, I mean, as like a white woman also, I feel like there is this naivety that has come out with all of, um, you know, Black Lives Matter and everything that it's like, you think that you're like an ally, but you're not like anti-racist and you're not really mm -hmm. hearing where like our black friends and significant others or whoever are really coming from and seeing and hearing their real struggles. Like, was there any turning points or anything that like, Kofo, you were like, why aren't you seeing what I'm seeing? Oh, girl. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm an extremely passionate person, things I believe in. Whenever, you know, anything would happen, and this is pre, you know, um, George Floyd and, you know, pre Ahmad, you know, things would happen and I'd react, you know, I'd talk to Theo about it and I wouldn't get that same passionate response from him. For me, I'm like, okay, I guess I'm just being too passionate. You know, at times I would just be like, oh, I'm just doing too much. You know, I just mm -hmm. need to like cool, it, calm it down a little bit. But, you know, over time, that's like, wait a minute, you're not as angry as I am and I'm going to need you to be as angry as I am mm. because this is... This is, this is real stuff that's happening. And yes, it's not to me, but it's to people that look like me. It's to people that look like my brother. It's to people that look like my father. It's to people that look like my mother. And it could be me, right. you know? So that's definitely changed. He's been such a champ. Like he's really putting in the work to understand. And at first I think we'd had these conversations, you know, years back and he wasn't getting, he didn't necessarily get where I was coming from mm -hmm. entirely. I mean, it, it took a few years before I realized there's a difference between black skin and long hair. I had long curly hair growing up and everyone thought I was a stoner and I used to get pulled over by cops all the time. So I thought I knew what it was like to be mm. like profiled. Oh, interesting. But, okay. but it's a very different mindset when you do it to yourself, uh -huh. right? It's like- You chose to have I, long I chose hair. long hair. I chose my look and I said, screw mm -hmm. them for being it. I'm going to keep doing it. Not, I, there's nothing I can change. It's just, it's how right. I look regardless of what I do when I go out every day. I, I've quoted that a ton because I think it's pretty enlightening to- a lot of people in my communities where they're like, well, I'm open and like, I've been judged or this or that. Like, no, yeah. no, <laughs> no, right. not, not, the, not same. the same. Again, he's been doing a great job of stepping up and learning and trying to, you know, reach out to his networks and communities to help them along too. You know, there are moments where there are things like, 
you know, tone policing. Like, again, I'm passionate. I'm a passionate black woman. Like, it's going to sound, you know, like I'm going off. But no, this, like, there is something to what I'm saying. So please don't police my tone. Like, I'm not, no, I'm not yelling. Like, I'm just passionate. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. and this is how it's going to come off. You know, like, so those conversations we've had to have where I'm like, no, 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 do you, I'm not going to back down on how I feel. I'm not going to you know, whisper how I feel to you. Like I'm, I'm going to communicate it the way I communicate it. I need you to accept it for what it is and try to understand it. Like, it's not about the tone. Like the content is still there. No, s- systemic racism works. H- hands down, it works, right? Like mm-hmm. I was fully tuned to, you know, all the things you can read about now with, we've got an example again last week of like making the black person look bad, but make the white person look good. There must've been a justified reason. Your natural intu- intuition as a white person is grown up here. Mm-hmm. That must be the truth. And that must be how it is. Mm-hmm. Or that somebody's overreacting or that right. like, for example, if we're talking, I'm overreacting and I just need to calm down. Like that was more, you know, and yeah, I mean, mindset. It, I mean, to be honest, it's probably been the last four years. Mm-hmm. The way I described it once is like when the current president was elected, I remember having these conversations about, I really don't care about the politics, but it scares me because this guy doesn't care about human rights. And I don't know what that's going to mean. And that was sort of like the depth of, of my thinking. And at that point, like it felt radical to like follow Sean King. And mm-hmm. it's just gotten worse since then. It's gotten more and more real and more and more accurate to the point where like, I mean, my day to day is affected at this point, right? Like I, I, You're more I mean, it's, the white, it's the white, I mean, and it's white guilt, right? Like, I don't know if that's the right term, but it's just like, I feel it all the time now. Especially as a white male. It's a, it's yeah. a real problem. Like I'm surrounded by people wherever I go who don't get it and it brings out rage in me. So it's like, I have that rage now. And I, I get it now. If you want to fight that this isn't about human rights, then we're going to fight, right? Because you're basically saying my family doesn't deserve safety. There's not mm-hmm. much more that gets like takes it home than that. Like, I'm sorry, you, you want to choose politics over my family's safety. That's like, forget it. You're done. It's like black and white now. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. You know, the thing is, since I've dated outside of my race many a times, also dated just within my race many a times too. And what's really been clear to me is that the American dream is systemic racism. And being an immigrant in this country, being told constantly that if you work hard, Mm -hmm. you can Mm -hmm. achieve anything, Mm -hmm. that is racism. Because I remember coming to this country, I was eight years old. And remember my classmates, we had, it was very diverse. I grew up in East Lansing, Michigan, very diverse, all different colors, all from all walks of life. We all started at the same place, third grade at this elementary school called Red Cedar. And our parents were all in the same programs at Michigan State. And you look at where we are now, and absolutely, we're not at the same level. But we started at the same level. And this is something I've had to not so much explain. And I don't know if you feel this way, Kofa. It was like, I don't want to explain, but I want you to feel what I felt. It's like this. Yes. I see the injustice. And whenever I I remember dating a guy who said, oh, you know, anybody can play football if you work hard (laughs) enough. Anybody can be really good at it. And I'm like, do you not see that that is just not possible in this country. So right. I think that's part of like what I've learned from dating outside my race is not the explaining. It's I just want people to feel it with me. 1000%. And I think it's tougher when you're in the relationship and you're like, no, you're supposed to love me. You know me. You know me for me. Like I need you. Like you love me. You know me. Why do I have to explain Mm-hmm. why I'm feel why this is making me angry. Why do I have to explain why this is making me, you know, so sad, like why it affects me so much. You know, I, I don't want to have to keep explaining. There are too many explanations. I mean, at yeah. this point, you know, like I'm explained out, you know, I'm tired. <laughs> so I feel like George Floyd and all the turn of events have definitely been like that, like curtain that's been lifted for America or some of America. I don't yeah. want to say all of America, but I guess yeah. like the one thing that I'd be curious is about like in a relationship where this doesn't like I think you kind of alluded to it Theo that this is personal now like this is involving me because we're a unit and we're a family like how have you kind of taken what's happening and like how do you guys discuss it like how do you move forward especially like as you're planning your future we just we just go for it we just it's open conversations it and and again I'm a passionate human being so if he says something I'm like you did not mean to say 
that that way and mm. here's why. Here's what you're really saying. Like you don't understand where you're wrong. Here's where you're wrong. You need to understand that. And I need you to understand that. And the tone of my conversations with him changed because you know, as I thought about you know our future children, I'm going to need you to understand for them. Because mm -hmm. I need you to see danger coming before it's there. You know, when you're watching our children, I'm not going to always be there. You're going to be there. And I need you to see it. In our relationship, there are some, there were some cases where you didn't see it. You know, you didn't see the, the stairs. You didn't see the nasty things that people would do. But you're going to have to see it when it's innocent children that can't defend themselves. So mm -hmm. like my, my tone is kind of like changed toward and direct, been directed more towards that, preparing him for black children. Mm -hmm. That's been the general shift for us things you say or things you dismiss. You can't easily dismiss some things. No, it's, it's not that simple. We had open conversation with, with his parents just to say, you are going to have little black grandchildren. We're going to need mm. you to put some work into understanding the inequalities and the in injustice that's going like that's happening. Like we, his parents are absolutely awesome and amazing. And, and that's not taking away from that, but it's just to say, you need to open your eyes a mm. little more to what's going on just because it's going to affect you specifically. It's a little different when it becomes your family. Like exactly. that's just the reality. 100%. Right? 100%. Yeah. And I think the thing too, is like, even if it becomes your family, like, <sighs> You know, you know, some families have that one person who's different, who might be black or or whatever race or you know, and they think of that person differently, like separate from race or from whatever it is. That's our daughter-in-law, but they don't think of me as their black daughter-in-law, who's part of the black of all black people, right? Like mm. you separate it, and that's where it becomes dangerous because you're not thinking, oh, this could actually be affecting her as well. <laughs> like, so I think it was more opening their eyes to that. Like, no, 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 these issues really affect me. Like I smile and I'm pleasant with you and I don't pour my heart out about all the injustices that ha have happened to me, but they've happened. Trust or, or call them out. Yeah. Right. Like or call them out on things. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's classically trained into at least my family and many other white families I know to just avoid conflict. Like oh, yeah. you're, mm -hmm. you don't mm -hmm. look to resolve a conversation. You look to end it and move on. Mm -hmm. and, Especially if it's uncomfortable. And, and my family does that like very frequently and I do it. I use humor. I do all that too. And so it's like mm -hmm. pushing everybody, including like my parents and siblings to have the conversations, like actually keep talking about it and keep understanding it. Don't like, Ooh, e oh, that's kind of hurts. Like, okay, yeah, uh -huh, and move on. Mm -hmm. I mean, because it, it wasn't right away when we told my parents that they, they got it, right? <laughs> no, they didn't right. get it right it away. Yeah. Let's hold that thought for a second. We'll get right back to it. This episode is sponsored by Via. We all know there are things that can help set the mood in the bedroom, but did you know a little THC could also do that? Yes, Via has developed a unique blend of pleasure-enhancing cannabinoids, libido-strengthening herbs, and a low dose of THC all into one mind-blowing gummy called High Love. This gummy, wow, it will awaken your senses, increase blood flow, and intensify any sexual experience. I've been pleasantly surprised by the High Love gummies because it is just the right amount of THC. THC for me to have a good time without feeling sleepy. And hey, if THC is not your thing, Via also offers a wide array of other gummies without it. And everything legally ships in 50 states with discreet packaging directly to your door. So if you're over 21, you can get 15% off and a free pack of award-winning Dreams THC plus CBN sleep gummies with our exclusive code DATEABLE at ViaHemp.com. That's V-I-I-A-H-E-M-P.com. Let the gummies work their magic. Head to ViaHemp.com and use the code DATEABLE to receive 15% off and one free sample of their sleepy dream gummies. That's ViaHemp.com and use the code D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E at checkout. Out. Take your passion and pleasure to a whole new level with high love from Via Hemp. As you know, I recently left my corporate job and I've been in total recovery mode all about self-care. One of my new routines is the nighttime shower before bed. There's just something about washing away the day and that reflection that's been super helpful for me. I've been using one of our partners, Osea's Mega Moisture Duo. This combo body oil and body lotion are so freaking incredible. It literally feels like I'm at a spa. I realize that the secret is seaweed and other skin level ingredients 
ingredients that are normally reserved for face products. And that's why I was so excited when Osea became one of our partners. And, you know, we're so grateful for partners like this because one, they keep the show going, but they're also super good for all of our listeners and for our own well-being. So if you want to have that nighttime bliss like I am doing, you can get 10% off your first order site-wide with code DATABLE at oseamalibu.com. You'll get free samples with every order and free shipping on orders over $60. So head to oseamalibu.com and use the code DATABLE for 10% off. Let us know which products you end up going with. Share them in social. Super excited to see what you end up choosing. Living with ADHD can be a challenge and dating with ADHD is definitely a challenge. We've heard many of you say, but finding the right care and proper tools needed to succeed can be life-changing. Done is an online ADHD care platform that can get you all the resources you need to help manage your ADHD. Online visits, refills, and a 24-7 care team made for you. In just one minute, Done's online assessment can help kickstart your ADHD treatment journey. With experienced clinicians, worry fill refills, and online visits, you can start getting personalized care as soon as today or tomorrow. So contact an expert team that can help you around the clock and get a personalized treatment plan just for you. Here's how you do it. Take a free one-minute assessment and book an appointment with a licensed ADHD clinician as soon as the next day. Get continuous care, one-click refills, insurance coverage, and 24-7 care team support with Done for just $79 a month. And pharmacy co-pays as low as $0. Visit get.donefirst.com slash podcast to learn more. That's get.donefirst.com slash podcast to learn more. Done. Turn ADHD into your strength. His mom has like overdosed on all the books you can possibly have. She signed up for an anti-racist uh, course online. She posted it for all of her friends to join her, Aww. you know, as, as she's doing this course. Uh, I guess they're doing a book club with her siblings, you know, where they then talk about, you know, how book clubs function. <laughs> they talk about the book. Thing, right? <laughs> oh, that's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. Just in case anyone wanted to know. <laughs> I don't know if she's driving it, but their church is examining. Oh, yeah, their church. church yeah. So their church is examining their, their religious impact on race and they're examining, they're also looking at other religions. So they're being more open mm. to all religions and which is, that was actually really cool when your dad mentioned that. Like, That's very progressive. Yeah. And like, do you think they'd be taking this next level if it wasn't for the grandchildren or like, do you think they still would have done this anyways or potential grandchildren? No. They no, probably wouldn't have done it unless they we said something. Unless, yeah, they wouldn't have done it unless he said something. They might have gone to the protest and they wouldn't know to, you, you know, right? They wouldn't know to take that next step and you know love them to death, but they wouldn't. They wouldn't. And as they, their experience is different, so how would that you know, especially of from an older generation? Like you're asking an older generation to retrain everything they know, um, and they're pretty progressive, you know, but. So you said that like the last Mm. four years has been really when these conversations have come to light with Trump and presidency and all that. But were you guys having these types of conversations before that too? Like how did that progress over the years? The conversations before that were me voicing my opinions about something and then him not not fully understanding and it just kind of getting and me not wanting him to feel uncomfortable. So the conversations would kind of get swept under the rug, Mm. you know. It's like, ooh, he's uncomfortable. Like, I'll either figure out a different way to say it or I'll just, you know, keep it moving. <laughs> I would wager it's, it, it was like a little bit more of a, a disbelief that it could be that bad. Mm. And then this is just all put it in front of your face. It's just there, right? Like, there's just too many damn facts. Right. Like, it's there. Mm-hmm. It's over and over and over again. And like, you keep peeling back the layer. Then it's like, how does anyone actually contest any of this? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So when Theo didn't understand, like, was there ever a point that you were like, I wish I was with someone that understood, like, this is a challenge with interracial relationships? Or did that thought never come to your mind? That thought never really came to my mind. It didn't come to my mind. Because I think for me, I felt the way I was trying to, you know, explain to him, I still felt that way. (sighs) I think I talked myself out of it in a way, Mm. you know, Mm -hmm. or I found 
you know, other people, t- like I talked to my brother about it, you know, I'm going to talk to somebody who understands, like he doesn't get it. Like he's not going to get it. That's okay. Like, you know, Theo's not going to understand. So I'll just, you know, I'll talk to my brother. I'll talk to my best friend, like whatever, you know, and I kind of moved on, but it wasn't like a, there was never a moment where I'm like, oh man, I really wish I was with a, you know, a black person that make it better. Now, the one thought I remember having was, would it be easier for him to be with a white woman? Wow. Is this your first time saying that out loud or have, have you guys discussed this before? That's my first time saying it out loud. Like I haven't really like discussed that with him, but that like sometimes it's just like, wow, there's a lot of baggage here. You know, you know, like there's a, there's just a lot. It's like maybe it'd be easier for, if he was with a white woman. But for me, it's just like, I just needed somebody to understand. <laughs> you know, yeah. I didn't necessarily ha- put it right. in context of being with a black man. And Theo, how do you, how do you feel hearing that that thoughts even crossed her mind. I'm not surprised. I mean, I think that's probably partially what was driving her to try and break it up after a week. She would have been thinking about difficulties for me. I mean, that's just her. She's too too damn empathetic for her own good. And that's what she would have been thinking. So yeah, I, I, I'm not surprised she's thought that at all. I mean, there's obviously new things we have to deal with by being in this relationship. And yeah, there's probably some hunky dory other versions that have different problems, but they're not these. And it's probably pretty easy to argue that they're simpler problems. <laughs> but has that thought crossed your mind? Is it a relationship would be so much easier if I was with someone who came from a similar background, similar experiences? Not not when it comes to race. <laughs> when it comes to race. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you for that question. <laughs> no, I mean it's <laughs> like it's it's it, it is comical because it's it's dumb stuff. I, I never go, oh my god, like uh, a white woman would be so easy. It, I've never I've never thought that. The stupid things I have thought are like, man, if I had like taught her snowboarding earlier, then like we could go to the more extreme mountains. Like it's, that, that's what it was like dumb shit, right? Like, I'm like, oh my God. So there's this TV show. I don't know if you've seen it. It's called Love in the Time of Corona. Have you seen this on Hulu? Oh, we, we haven't started it yet. <laughs> yeah. But there's a storyline. It's I mean, they must have shot it like ASAP because they were like hitting everything yeah, yeah, that's yeah. happened in 2020. And there's yeah. a storyline between a black couple and the wife wants to have another child and the man right. is very hesitant and it comes out the reason why he's hesitant is that he doesn't want to b- bring another black boy into this world into this, or even right. a black girl just given all the police brutality right. and everything right. that's happening have you guys right. thought about that have you had conversations in that realm oh yeah i there have been many tears i've shed saying that i don't know i don't want to do like I've, I've been looking for countries or islands to buy and move to. <laughs> like I don't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, for for the longest time, I thought I would be doing some justice to the world by having mixed children. But yeah, now I'm scared. Mm. I'd say now I'm scared. I mean, I I, I want children. I'm not going to not have children. Am I a lot more open to leaving the U.S.? Yeah. I'm also a little bit of a realist in that the grass is just a different color, exactly. green exactly. everywhere. Like, I don't know that it's going to be perfect, but I am to the point now where I'm accepting the U.S. is pretty low on a lot of ratings that are important. And I'm not like, wave my flag or anything, but it's like, it's where I'm from. So it's a little weird for me to be like. where we're both from. I mean, let's say you stay in the U.S. You said you don't want to put your life plans on hold to have a baby. Like, what would you do to kind of prepare for the potential racism that this child could see in their lives? I mean, I started off by examining every aspect of my childhood that I wish you know, could have been better in terms of like representation. And I'm going to double up basically mm. all the books <laughs> will be about black children. You know, they will see themselves in everything in our home. Obviously it'd be great to reflect that then in the communities that we build. So that's another thing, like trying to build that community where there's that diversity. That's not, that's not always possible. You know, like where we live right now is not the most diverse place. So, you know, that's going to be a task to figure that out. Um, we're definitely putting in that work to do, to do it. Every black person will tell you they have that conversation with their children, you know, about how you're supposed to act, what you're supposed to, you know, like how you're supposed to conduct yourself. Now, obviously, those conversations are already locked in my brain. 
to have with them, but it's just going to enforce how, and not that my parents didn't do this, but just to reinforce how amazing they are and how, you know, their color is just an enhancement of their beauty. It's not a detriment, you know, like they're going to be people that try to get you down. There are going to be people that make fun of your hair texture, that make fun of the fact that you have two different types of parents. They're, they're going to be those people. That's okay. Be, come home and tell me. Come home and tell your dad. Be able to talk about that with us. Because I think that was one thing growing up that my brother and I didn't do. We had all that stuff happen to us in school and out there in the public. And we never really came home to tell our parents about it. You know, we just internalized it. And I know how that has translated to me, you know, being an adult. It's not great. You know, I'm just Mm -hmm. dealing with this stuff now. And so I want my kids to have that space to be able to just come to us right away when these things happen. So we'll deal with it in the moment, you know? Yeah, I mean, classic white person for a while. (laughs) We talked about education a lot, like as if that's the, you know, the silver bullet to racism. I mean, obviously, it's a huge, huge part of it. I think it's a little more than that. I, I used to think that was always a thing. People just need education. And so, you know, you focus on getting getting your kids good education, then it'll be fine. But I mean, they persuade. have, I mean, the education ha- is, has to be good. Uh, but what? No. I'm, well, okay. So now you're witnessing now something. What? Because for me, it's always been a little black kid has no choice but to be educated. My, mm. my child, like I've always, that's been like, they're going to have the best education. They're going to go to the best schools. And that's because they can't, they, they're not of the privilege to not be, to not do that. Yeah. My point is that like focusing on education to me was like something that I thought was enough. It's not enough. It's by far not enough. What else are you focusing on then? What's the combination? What's the? Immersing them in cultures, like teaching them properly, making sure, I don't know, maybe you can put all this in education but are you saying education as it is like going to just learning in school in schools as they are yeah oh okay okay so like yeah we've talked about that right okay i would say it's made me think about money more i think having kids is a little bit of like okay i want to be build wealth a little bit more as a higher priority so that i always have a safety net for my kids i don't want to make it easy per se but like I want to have a safety net. I don't want to ever have my kids have to worry about it because I know the world's not going to be fair to them. But also to your point though, Kofo, is that for an underprivileged race to get ahead in this country, education Mm -hmm. is the baseline. There is no Mm -hmm. choice there. You have to get an education. And for anybody, I mean, I've had conversations with friends who are like, College is optional. College isn't yeah, for exactly. everyone. I'm like, for, <laughs> that blows my mind. for a lot of minorities and for a lot of immigrants, yeah, yeah. that is the only option to even just enter exactly. into this workforce and exactly. this society. This is a lot to think about. I mean, it's not just about interracial marriage at this point. It's right. just about right. marriage <laughs> and, and, all the, and how all it's going to work. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then the interracial part is an added layer of complexity to all of that. And this is something that I've, I've been like trying to feel it out for a long time is, you know, sometimes for a while, like interracial dating was trendy. It was cool. Yeah, like it was yeah, like, oh, yeah. cool. Oh, Everybody yeah. should have yeah. mixed babies because they're right. so good yeah. looking and diversify your genes. Oh, good goodness. Yes. But I do think what this year has shed light on is that interracial dating is absolutely more complex Mm -hmm. than non interracial dating. I I, I don't think we need to hide that fact anymore. And it's, and when we enter into interracial relationships, we are taking on the plight of your partner as well. That becomes your fight, that becomes your struggle. And then when you frame it in a way of offsprings, that's brings a whole other level. That's not just our fight anymore. This is like Mm -hmm. this our village what we're 100%. fighting for together well because theo you are now like having a black child in this world right like that's mm-hmm. like something i mean like i know that you are obviously like you guys are a family now but it is taking it right. one step further yeah it's a big step further <laughs> yeah. kofo can take care of herself pretty well but children can't right it's like a very different thing mm-hmm. um not that i should allow kofo to always take care of herself though <laughs> <laughs> she rolls her eyes <laughs> <laughs> but yes, this is we're peeling back the layers of what used to be like so trendy and cool. It's cool to mm-hmm. date outside your race. I've also had guys tell me I can date you, I won't marry you. 
You know, I've oh, had that fun. conversation yeah. too. <laughs> yeah. You're like, oh, it's fun to date someone yeah, outside exactly. of your race, but you don't see like a permanent future with me. You know, like, I think this is where we are in our society today is mm-hmm. that people need, before they enter into these relationships, there, there's a lot to think about. Mm-hmm. And you brought up a good point about having, you know, how it used to be trendy to have mixed, mixed children because mm-hmm. they're, they're beautiful, whatever. If mm-hmm. I had a dollar for every time <laughs> someone told me, that our child would be so beautiful. I'm like, well, damn, that's a lot uh-huh. of pressure. I hope this child does come out beautiful <laughs> because it's, a, it's too much. You know what I mean? It's too much. Like, for what? I'm like, I, that is never my first response to any couple. But, like, to a white couple, I'm never like, oh, my goodness. Oh, your baby's going to be so beautiful. Oh, my No, gosh. usually wait till it's out. And I, I mean... Yeah. Come on. Like, that's just not a, before the baby's been born. I'm like, I don't, that, I, I've never, that's never been my first reaction. Babies. Or you guys would make beautiful babies. I can't wait for your beautiful baby. We've, heard that, we've heard that a lot. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, you both, there's so many layers that we're like actively peeling back even right now. But like, <laughs> I mean, we've also heard extreme stories. I mean, part of why we wanted to bring you on though, is because like, a lot of people wonder like, oh, is there challenges with family members? And like relatively, right. you had a very accepting world in that regard. So there's right. some stories we've heard. There was one that was posted to our Facebook group recently about an Asian man and black woman. And they were basically like outed by their friends and family. And it was like really mm-hmm. bad. Like what advice <sighs> would you guys give to anyone that's going through something that might even be more of a struggle in terms of not have full acceptance i mean honestly right now i wouldn't have said it at some point not that long ago but cut them off cut who off be specific i mean well it's it's <laughs> it sounds like people aren't open to it right cut They're, the families off. yeah the cut the ones, who, should cut cut the ones off like like that's how that's how important it is, right? If this is a person you choose to be with, you need to make it clear to everybody else that, that they're that important mm-hmm. and you're willing, right? Like, I mean, I have family members that mm-hmm. I've gone to battle with and then they've wanted to just say, oh, we live through a different lens or something. And I said, no, we're not going to keep talking. And that's on the, his fa- he's referring to a family member that's on the forever Trumper mm. like Mm-mm. spectrum of things to where he has had to explain, <laughs> I'm going to need you to understand that there are things that affect that what this man is doing that are unacceptable. Like, I agree with that. I would say, though, that, you know, there are some families where it's diff- it's a little harder to just cut people off like that, you know? So it's not like, it's not so easy to just say, deuces, you know, I'm out. It's more difficult. And I think in that instance, you have to really reflect on your relationship and say, and, and really try to understand if, if you are in it for the long haul, because cutting off a family member in that type of family means a whole different, like, you, it's not ignored. That's something that will affect you emotionally for a long time like it isn't easy for some people especially like yeah like a, especially a direct family member, direct right? family like, like I'm, it's, I'm talking it's, about like, a couple moved here yeah but the direct family members that like that's the that's the point like how do you deal with that and i think for that it's really look within yourselves and can you make it without that support because if you continue to do what you're doing i mean either they come come on board or they don't but understand that that's again another battle you're gonna have to fight you're gonna have to fight you know like holidays aren't going to be the same or you might not have holidays and that's it's going to define your relationship. If that's the case, the two of you have got to be tight, like mm-hmm. solid. Like you've got to be there for each other in every aspect, you know? Because I think for us, a lot of the time it was like us against the world, it felt like. Yeah, and it was, I was just you know, going to ask you that. Do you feel like it's you against the world? Yeah, we've said that to each other sometimes. Like even, you know, with friends and, and family, or whatever, sometimes it's just felt like us against the world. And that's how we've been able to get through a lot of tough stuff, you know? It's like, well, I've got you, you've got me. Here we go. <laughs> to your point, like, you probably should have that deep down conversation with yourself before you get to the stage I said, you better have that deep down conversation. Are you going to be able to separate from it, your It's family? not going to go away in case it gets better. But yeah, you might not be talking to a father or a mother or something like that. Yeah. That's a big deal. It's a very big deal. It's going to affect you emotionally. It's going to affect your relationship very directly. Like you might start to resent the other person for that. You know, and you want to make sure you are having those conversations and being open about it and not just letting it go. You have to confront it. Don't just ignore it and just figure, oh, well, we're like a million miles away. So we don't have to ever see them or talk to them. No, like you've got to 
confront it, you know? Like, I know we've talked so much about it. And I love this whole, like, me against the world, like, me and you against the world. Like, is there any other benefits that you really feel like being an interracial couple has helped you both develop personally and then also strengthen your own bond? I mean, I'm perfect, so I don't know. He needed all my people. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I can say by leaps and bounds, I have far more perspective than I ever would have uh, if I had not been in an interracial relationship for so long, by the way, mm-hmm. right? Like, mm-hmm. it wasn't like day one or year five or year yeah. 10. It was a while. I'm sure if I thought about it a little longer, it, it helps in probably all, all parts of life. Um, mm mm-hmm realizing how many different perspectives there are and how you need to look at things differently and you need to assess what's really going on uh, to a deeper level. I mean, how much good food exists in the world? Uh, yep. <laughs> yeah, as, she, as she would say, food with flavor. Uh, yes. It's true. I didn't really like spicy food before I had Nigerian. And now he cooks it. Now he makes yeah, it. Now it's, yeah. <laughs> look at that. Wow. <laughs> that's incredible. Find you one who can cook your food. <laughs> What about you, Kofo? I would say that I've become more patient in trying to explain things to him and more willing and open to explaining things to him or to an, to another person, period. Because for a time it was just like, you know, hold it all in, internalize it. It's like, just deal with it on your own. Keep it, like, just keep moving forward. Being in this relationship with Theo has caused me to, you know, communicate those things that like the emotions that are, you know, going through me like more openly just to, just to get them out there. Like I don't have to suffer and be sad or angry on my, all on my own Mm -hmm. and, you know, complete that cycle by myself. I, you know, I have him and obviously that's, it's not just, that's not because he's white necessarily, but obviously the whiteness amplifies it some just because like, again, we're constantly having to have the conversations, you know, daily, but yeah, I would say it's 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 made me more open and patient in communicating my emotions about race and inequality. Well, sometimes when you date someone who's too similar to you, you have the same internalized problems mm-hmm. and issues where right. the common denominator cancels each other out right. and you don't right. address them. Right. But right. by being with someone who comes from a totally different background, it's almost like therapy for you too because you have to constantly yeah. like – take a step forward and think, oh, why do I feel that way? And look at your childhood, yeah. take a step back. It is part therapy and it's part trauma, right? Yeah. Because it's having to relive all of that stuff. Yes. And, but that's okay. Because I, again, that's the, that's where the therapy part kicks in. You know, mm-hmm. I have to get it out and I have to grow from it and learn from it and figure out how I want to make sure our, our children don't experience that same thing, you know? Mm-hmm. This is a good way to talk about takeaways, too, because I feel like this is um, definitely generating some ideas for me of what I'm I'm taking away from this conversation. So here's a trend we've been seeing this year is that there uh, a lot of people are opening up their preferences on their dating apps due to the nature of what's been happening this year. So I think everyone's kind of exploring outside their race, exploring outside of their usual type, which is great. But we're also getting a lot of newbies into this category of not knowing how to Inter, into interracial relationships. And I, I guess the takeaway I would have for anybody who is entering into these relationships is to know that it is not going to be easy. I mean, I think that's, we can't sugarcoat it. No. It's not going to be easy. There are levels of complexity. And also you have to get your armor ready because there may be some battles and you have to get ready to fight. But it's so worth it in the end. I, the feeling of us against the world It's actually a very incredible, empowering feeling to know that you and your partner Mm -hmm. can take on this world, especially in light of what's been happening. So I I think that's a huge takeaway for anybody who's new to, you know, dating outside their race. The other takeaway I have is it like it really affected me when you were talking about your offsprings and your kids and how you would raise them. I think that's a conversation people can have on dates these days, not about their Mm -hmm. kids together, but to say, in light of what's happening in today's society, how would you raise your kids Mm -hmm. today? Yeah. And how would you navigate what's happening? I think that that would be an incredible conversation to have. Yeah, 100%. 
Even if you're not in an interracial relationship, you should be having that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that. (laughs) And the thing about that too, is like not only how you would raise your kids, but how are your friends raising their kids? Because those are the kids your kids are going to hang out with. Yep. You know, Mm. we've had that conversation. We're like, oh, okay, cool. So this one's going to be a little, you know what? Great. We're going (laughs) to, we'll be over here. (laughs) Right. Right. I never even thought about that. Oh yes. Oh yes. (laughs) I think the biggest takeaway I have is for so long, we were supposed to say like, oh, we're all the same. We're not different, you know? And I think what's really come to light with all of Black Lives Matter, but also this conversation is like, no, we have to really accept that we are different. We have to see color. Mm -hmm. And if we're not seeing that, then it doesn't allow us to really have these deep conversations that lets the other person be seen and heard. Like your conversation actually reminded me a lot of a conversation that I had with one of my best friends and one of UA's friends. And she put up a video on Instagram uh, around the times of George Floyd just being like, I don't blame my white friends and my Asian friends and all my non-black friends. I haven't let you see me for who I really am. And I've been holding that back. So I'm not blaming you. And it kind Mm -hmm. of reminded me of your conversation. It's like for so long, it's easy to be like, oh, am I overreacting or they don't get it? Or, you know, like I'm sure I don't know what I've said along the way, but I'm sure I've said something that was like brushing feelings under the rug Mm -hmm. a little. And like, I think it's so important that we just put that open and, you know, like, the party lets them be fully seen. And then the receiving end also really doesn't try to, doesn't try to empathize, just lets them Mm -hmm. be heard. I think so often we try to find solutions to problems and sometimes people don't want a solution. They just want to be heard. No. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. 100%. 100%. And it's hard, you know, in our networks and friends and groups, like I am the one, I'm usually the one, black person Mm -hmm. so it's difficult being the one right you know and it's difficult then given everything that's happened i've been more vocal with more people publicly Mm -hmm. about how i feel and how this stuff affects me and things that have happened to me to the point where people are like wow i didn't i didn't know that happened to you i'm like well yeah what do you think i'm gonna sit here and have you know a million and one conversations about how kids picked on me picked on me for my hair picked on me like Mm -hmm. that's not how you set it up you didn't set it up for me that way you know and that's not your fault but alas, here we are. <laughs> you know? Right. I think the other takeaway I have is throughout this whole thing, you both just looked at each other as another person, as a person that you mm-hmm. fell in love with. It wasn't so much about race, especially when you're in college and you kind of, yeah. you know, you're not even thinking about any of this stuff. And I think, though, one of the things we've heard from past episodes that we've done of people that are like struggling more in the dating scene is when they get fetishized or they get like comments about their race. And I think everyone has unanimously said is I just want to be treated as a individual. Mm -hmm. I don't Mm -hmm. want people to be so fixated Mm -hmm. on my race, even if it's supposedly positive. Right. So I think one takeaway that I have from this whole combo is like, you guys really, you know, you just love each other for who you are, not necessarily the race part. 100%. I mean, one, I mean, for me, 100%, because if it was a race part, I don't, I mean. It wouldn't have lasted. It would, well, I, I mean, would hope not. <laughs> <laughs> if the only thing holding you together <laughs> is each other's in this country. <laughs> you're like, uh-uh, you're getting a little tanned. This is not working for me anymore. <laughs> My God. Yeah, she's like, put lotion on. <laughs> no, I mean, that, that is, that's, that's another difference though, race. Like, I put lotion on every day. Like, I have to put lotion on. I can't uh-huh. get be dry, okay? That's the thing. This man is aging like a raisin. He refuses <laughs> to put lotion on, like, won't moisturize, and doesn't understand that, like, there is a process that goes with oh, being God. a black woman. There is. Hair? Yep. Oh, that's another one. We'll talk about that. Let me put on a wig. Why do you have to put on a wig? It's a protective style. I'm gonna need you to stop asking me questions and get over it. Just embrace it. Go with it. <laughs> Just exactly. appreciate the end product. It's called okay. Black Girl Magic. I need you to give me a compliment and not ask questions about why I'm doing it. We do have one last question we ask all of our guests, which is <laughs> since you're on the dateable podcast, what does being dateable mean to you? I think being dateable for me is the same as just as being a good friend, as being a good family member, as being a good community member. It's being a decent human being for the love of all that's good. You know, it's not, 
you know, everybody throws around ally and all this. And I, I, I can't stand the word ally. I tell you that much because what does that mean? Like, what is that? That gives you a badge for something you should be doing anyway. Mm. <laughs> right. It gives you a gold star for being a decent human being. I don't do gold stars. Just be a decent human being. That's it. That's it for me. Just be decent. Yeah. Just and be decent. Return like, IMs. <laughs> yes. <so. laughs> don't Full forget circle. that. Full circle. I was probably on ICQ. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I remember ICQ. <laughs> What was that noise it would make? (laughs) I can't remember. It's like a little bird. And Theo, for you, what does being dateable mean to you? I don't know the last time I thought about that, but... I wouldn't hope you were thinking about it. (laughs) I think it, for me, it just starts with a conversation. Like, you you have to, it would have to be someone who's transparent and you know you talk to them and you can trust what they're saying and go from there, really. Like, that's, that's the start of it. If you, if you can't feel like at ease and have a natural conversation... And honest with each other, for me, I, I err on the side of too transparent and honest, I think. But like, mm-hmm. there's no reason to beat around the bush and play games. Like, let's just have exactly. a real no conversation and see from there. Mm-hmm. Like, we got deep convos <laughs> to be having about race and systemic yeah, no racism now. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. There it is. Marriage. And it's, <laughs> it's fun, I swear it is. <laughs> we got so Theo different. and Kofo. Thank you so much for telling us your story and sharing yes. your experience. Yeah, thank as, you. And, of course. And thanks for letting us watch things as it happens. I mean, I felt like I was watching a show. At some point, I forgot we were on a podcast. <laughs> TV show is really good. What's going to happen next? It was like real <laughs> time <laughs> working it out. I love it. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was like, this is a, yeah. there a couple of times there i'm like what are you saying that's that's normal (laughs) can't wait for the next episode but for all of our listeners who really enjoy this conversation we would very much uh, appreciate a five-star review in apple podcast because that helps us bring more guests just like theo and kofo to tell us their stories and not be afraid to share them because now they know we're legit people (laughs) so (laughs) thank you again for sharing your story thank you all for listening at home and we're still looking for guests for the season so if you like to share your story you know someone who, who can share their story maybe Maybe there's like, maybe you have experienced a very tumultuous interracial relationship. We love to hear that too. So come share your experience on the Dateable Podcast. We're going to wrap this up. Stay Stay Dateable. Dateable! The Dateable Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Want to continue the conversation? First, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter with the handle at Dateable Podcast. Tag us in any post with the hashtag stay dateable and trust us, we look at all of those posts. Then head over to our website, datablepodcast.com. There you'll find all the episodes as well as articles, videos, and our coaching service with vetted industry experts. You can also find our premium Y series where we dissect, analyze, and offer solutions to some of the most common dating conundrums. We're also downloadable for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Overcast, Stitcher Radio, and other podcast platforms. Your feedback is valuable to us, so don't forget to leave us a review. And most importantly, remember to stay dateable. Thank you.